6 o'clock. I think it's uh, rather important that uh, uh, each and every one of us that can be there, that we try to make it to those, those uh, classes so that uh, we can understand what uh, some of the qualifications are, some of the issues. If you have questions, that's a good time for questions. But, uh, you know, we have, Gail and I have talked some, and uh, we think that it's, it's time that we start at least pursuing that topic. Uh, we're both getting older. Uh, I plan on retiring in two months. <coughs> My plans hold true. There may be some times in there where we may, we may be gone for a month at a time. We we'll get out and about, but uh, we need to uh, seriously start looking at that at that topic. Not in that we're needs to be in a big hurry, but um, these are just definite topics. That if we don't if we don't pursue them and we uh, are prepared for them, that when when that happens, then it's to be a chaotic situation, and I don't think we need that. This is, everything's been working well until this virus comes along. I think we're even working through pretty well on that. So uh, we just pray that uh, that uh, each one of you would, would uh, look in your own uh, desires of what you want for that individual as we move forward. And this just is a good opportunity for us to, to just uh, interact a little more on that topic. Certain that uh, we continue on with sound leadership. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> since I'm a, the newer guy around, and I'm not bound by too many traditions, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a leap. Um, as I was. Uh, reading through and preparing for a Bible study this morning, I was flipping through the Psalms, and I flipped through Psalm 100, and I'd just like to read it for you, because I think as we open up, as we gather together, as we come before the Lord, I think this Psalm is short, won't take too long, but I really think uh, and hope and pray that it kind of sets the pathway for us this morning. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth all generations. Amen. Amen. You know, as we live in this time where we're virtual, where we're together, and where we're separate, and yet together, and all of these things going on in our lives, the separation that we've endured, the truth is, is that God is here. He loves us. He has created us for a purpose. He's created us to be together, to share in whatever format we can. He is good. I think verse 5 really is good for me, and that He is good, His mercy is everlasting, and his truth is for all time. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day that we can come for the life-giving rain, albeit a lot. <laughs> Father, thank you for how you have created us in your image, that you have created us to have relationship with you and with each other. And so, Father, this morning we come with thanksgiving in our heart. Regardless of the circumstances of our lives and the things that are happening, we are mindful of all those who are struggling. And yet, at the same time, Father, we know that the truth is that your son came to provide us a way to come back to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To provide us that path to ultimately have in, internal and in, in unquenchable joy with you when he comes again. So, Father, as we enter this time, I, I ask that you bless all of the things that are done. That it, it would be just a, a pleasant smell in your ear, in your nose. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. 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 Good morning.
To God be glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son. To yield in his life an atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear him. Praise the Lord! 
Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 and 30. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung with him, they went, <clears throat> went out to the Mount of Olives. So we come uh, to this point in our service every week to uh, remember and give thanks for uh, what Jesus did for us. We wouldn't have the um, the eternal life after after this earthly life without Him. So we take this time to give thanks and remember uh, what He's done for you personally. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this time that you have allowed us to come and worship you. Lord, we pray that as we take in, uh, this bread that we can remember and uh, what you did for us, and thank you for that. We pray that we take this bread in the uh, right mindset and uh, what you did. We ask prayer in your son's name. Let's stand, please.
Sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share each other, our aches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get Next song is 742. You're going to sing for this. Stand for this one, please. <laughs> when a pot like Philip, you are fed the songs. When you are discouraged and in a whole exhaust, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done.
for our crimes, acquitted for our sins. And what the necessity of that is and how to go about it. We then move to the word righteousness, achieving right standing in the eyes of God. Nothing that we could do ourselves, but it was made available to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We then moved on to faith and the role that that requires because God has shared with us that our salvation is a product of his grace and his mercy. And we are only able to tap into that through faith. And we spent a lot of time talking about that as well. So today, uh, we, we, we wrap up this journey. We've tried to give you the opportunity, family, believers, the opportunity to be able to craft a story that you can share with those who are non-believers, perhaps those who are curious, perhaps those who are seeking. Because many times, we understand that we have a responsibility to go into all nations and to make disciples, to teach, to baptize, and to continue to teach. But many of us say, I, I just don't know what to say. I don't know what to teach you. So the last five weeks has been designed to give you what to say. Now, I wouldn't expect for you to preach four sermons Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But I would, I would hope that we would listen to them, learn from them, put it into bite-sized chunks that we can understand and work with and be comfortable with and begin to share it. Because yeah. as we shared in class this morning, family, <clears throat> church, it's not about what we do here. It's about what we do out there. Mm -hmm. Come on, y'all. Amen. 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 Uh, because if we get to heaven and we haven't brought anyone with us, we could have done better. Yeah. We could have done better. We, we understand that when we became Christians, we took on the obligation to share with others. Now, we can't control whether or not they become Christians, but we can share. We can control whether we share. Mm -hmm. And so all of this has been designed to equip us to share. And we've, we've taken the story, we've taken the rationale, we've taken why things are what they are, how they came to be what they, what they need to be, and how salvation works, what it all is about. And so we've discussed all of that, so today we're going to talk about baptism, because that has a role. We have not yet talked about that. We've talked about a lot of things as it relates to the journey that we take from a fallen, dead state to a living, everlasting, heaven-bound state. And we've gone through all of the necessary portions of hearing and believing and repenting and confessing. We've done all that. But we've not yet talked about baptism. And we believe that baptism is a component of this that mm -hmm. definitely needs to be discussed. And so that's what we're talking about that's today. Right. Um, and I'm sure that we here have heard many sermons on baptism. So it may be that I won't tell you anything that you haven't heard today. But then again, I'm <laughs> uh, uh, so let me give you the context here. We're going, to, we're going to be talking in Romans chapter 6, but there's a necessary prelude to the conversation found in Romans chapter 5. And I won't read all that for you, but I'll encourage you in your private study time uh, to take a look at Romans chapter 5 and all of chapter 6 when you have an opportunity. But I can tell you, and please check me on this, you know how I feel about that, uh, is that we are told in chapter 5 that there was a first Adam. We all know who the first Adam was, first man, Adam. That's mm -hmm. the only one that we know of as Adam. But we also know, family, that from Adam came sin. We know the story about Garden of Eden. We know the story about the serpent and the forbidden fruit and how that all came about. And so it was due to the actions of the first Adam. Obviously, he was with him as well, but we're just talking about comparing figures here, that sin entered the world. And once sin entered the world, then death was Intimate. a result. A result. Spiritual death, separation from the original arrangement that God had in mind, as well as physical death. Again, we can make the argument that physical death should not have taken place if we, in fact, had eaten from the tree of life, which we had access to. It was only one tree that we weren't to eat from. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we had access to every other thing in the garden, including the tree of life. That's where we would make that argument. That's not what we're doing here today, though. And so after this sin and after this death, there came to be the law. And we talked quite a bit about the law, but we understand that the law was designed to teach man 
what the righteousness of God was all about and to put man in a position to understand what that is. Law came as an education about sin. Law came to point out uh, the presence of sin. And when we realize, or the Hebrews at that time for whom the law was written, realized that they could not obey the letter of every law, then they should have arrived at the conclusion that something else was needed. And that something else was a savior. That someone else was Jesus. Amen. That brings us, family, to the second Adam, who is in fact Jesus. Why would we call him a second Adam? Because the first Adam was the father of all humanity. Mm -hmm. Oh, but the second Adam, Jesus, is uh, 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 the father of the new humanity. Is that all right? right. And so he's, he's referred to as such in the scripture, so I'm not just making this up. And so through Jesus, family, came sacrifice. We, we, we know that, that death was required for sin. And, and, but, but God did not cause us to pay that debt in the way that it should have, but basically put things on hold. And so when we look at the Old Testament, we see all the bulls and the goats and all those things that were sacrificed. That was a placeholder until the only sufficient sacrifice could be brought to bear. And that sufficient sacrifice, that more than sufficient sacrifice, was in fact Jesus. When he hung on the cross, when he died uh, on the cross, when he was buried in the tomb, yet he rose again. That is what was required in order uh, to remove the sin that we have in our lives. Through that family came the acquittal for the sins that we have committed. Through that family came the imputation of righteousness, right standing before God. We couldn't do that ourselves, but it was done through Jesus. Through that, through him, came life. The life that we lost and gave up due to sin, we were now able to have back. Through that came Grace, God's willingness to provide it to us even though we do not and did not deserve it. And so chapter 5 wraps up in verse 20 and 21 that essentially says the more the law revealed sin and death, the more grace accomplishes. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. I want you to get this yeah. concept. The last couple of verses say that the more that the law showed people what sin is, the more that grace comes along and accomplishes mm -hmm. the eradication of that. Right, amen. That leads us to our text for today, found in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. Family, I'm going to read all of it because I think it's important for us to hear it. But I won't necessarily uh, go through every verse as it is my habit to do. But we'll make sure that we get all the juice out of it. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. And so the Bible says, as Paul is writing to the church at Rome, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we might too walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, Certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self family was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we no longer would be slaves to sin. Verse 7 says, for he who has died is free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we should also live mm -hmm. with him. Is that all right? Yeah, Knowing right. that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master 
over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. May the Lord add a huge blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his divinely inspired word. Amen. 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 Oh, family. Family, family, family. There is such good news here today, and it is important that we understand this good news to the very best of our ability because it is important. Because to me, family, it is, in, it is it's surprising to me how controversial the topic of baptism is amongst those who are believers. And I want to be careful how I describe people because there are all kinds of people who believe in God. There are all kinds of people who believe in Jesus. There's uh, uh, Episcopalians, and there's Presbyterians, and there's Catholics, and there's Methodists, and, and there's members of the Churches of Christ, and then there's the Christian Church. There's all these groups of people who are believers in God, yet they don't agree on some of the essentials of the Christian faith. Amen. And I don't know about you, family, but I've always said, and I've always taught my children, Know why you believe what you believe. Amen. Amen. You believe whatever you want to believe, but know why you believe that. And so we here as a body, we here as the members of the Fairgrounds Road Church of Christ, we here as members of the body of Christ in universal uh, have a set of beliefs that comes to us from the word of God. I'm not going to share anything with you that is my opinion. I'm not going to share anything with you that I've been told to share with you by the elders. I'm only going to share with you what must say it, the Lord. Is that all right? Amen. It's right Amen. in the Bible for anybody who cares to bend their will to it rather than bending it to their will. Mm -hmm. It's right there. Amen. So, there's so much to be said about baptism. And I wish I had time to say it all. I could probably do five sermons on baptism. Well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I could. <laughs> because it's that much of a complex uh, topic. And there's so much that has been written about it, biblically and extra biblically. And to be able to talk about the different views so that you get an objective understanding of those things that have been said uh, is something that we could do. Uh, well, we're not going to, but I trust that the things that we share with you today are going to be all you need. And if it's not, then we can talk about further study at a later time. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, I believe that Romans chapter 6 represents the best explanation of what baptism is, what it's for, how it works, what it accomplishes, and why we should do it. Amen. Is, is that all right? Uh, it's all right there for anyone who's willing to take the time to read it and study it to understand and embrace if they so choose. This morning, I'd like for us to pursue this from three points. I'd like for us to consider the interrogative. I'd like for us to consider the imitation and also the intent. I find that when I start everything with the same letter, you guys held on to it for a little bit longer. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the interrogative, right? And the interrogative is nothing more than a series of questions. It's a fancy word for questions. And I believe, I don't have to believe, I can read it for myself just like you can, that the Apostle Paul in his conversations with the church at Rome begins to ask them a series of questions. He says right there in the verse, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may uh, uh, abound? No. Uh, how shall we die to, the, to sin? Uh, and how, should, how, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? That's the second question. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus have been baptized into death? That's three questions. Three questions. Mm -hmm. So that's an interrogative. And I'd like for us to take those up one at a time. 
I'm going to phrase them differently than he did, but I've already told you what he said, so I'm not going to change what he said. I'm just going to phrase it differently. Okay? Question one. If grace is so great, if grace is full and free, wouldn't it be that much more powerful if we send more? <laughs> or I want you to see the logic of the question in all its illogic. Paul had already said that the law is insufficient to make you just and to make you righteous. What you need, family, is not the law, but what you need is grace. Because what the law has done, it has showed you sin. It has showed you what sin is. But I want you to know that there's something that is more powerful than sin. And what's more powerful than sin is the grace of God. Amen. The grace of God will overcome sin. And so those who he's talking to ask this question. Now again, he's asking hypothetical questions, but it's a conversation. And so they're saying, okay, law, not so great. Law, we couldn't follow. Law just pointed out to us where we have problems. But grace can take away the sin that we have. I get it. So how about this? What if we were to sin more so that this grace that you're telling me about that's stronger than sin would be shown even stronger? That grace would be made even mightier by us continuing to sin. You know, on television, family, when you've got those products that they try to sell you, and you've got some uh, some pitch man who, who's saying, uh, just use this, and this will happen. Uh, scrape this on that, and then you can build a boat out of it. All that kind of stuff, right? And, and, and so you'll have some cleaner, uh, perhaps with oxygen in it or something like that. And you won't take like a normal stain, but now you're dumping ink and grease and dirt and all kinds of stuff, grass stain, just rubbing it all in there. Yeah, get it in there. We're going to show you how much more powerful this product is than that, right? And then they would uh, put, the, put the product on there, and it would make it as it was brand new, right? And so the idea is, is to add more and more dirt to prove the strength, to bring out the strength of whatever the cleaning agent is. Why don't we, family, sin more so that the blood of Jesus Christ, the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, will be shown to be that much more strong, that much more powerful, that much more saving? Why? Why don't we do that? Doesn't that make sense? And Paul says, and Paul says, and Paul says, Dave, and I'm paraphrasing, don't be stupid. <laughs> Are you kidding? Don't be stupid. Why on earth would you want to sin more so that grace that saved you from sin can abound? Grace does not need to abound for itself. Grace is not an entity that has to prove who and what it is. Grace is a gift from God that is free to you and it accomplishes a certain thing in you. It's not about the strength of it having to come up to where you are, it already takes care of that. And you can't add anything to it that's going to make it any stronger than it is. You're looking at the whole thing wrong. Amen. He says, that is coming from a wrong heart. If you say, why don't we sin more so that grace can abound, what you're telling me is that you enjoy the sin life. What you're telling me is that you seem to have forgotten that sin put you in trouble in the first place. What, what you're telling me is that you don't understand that there is an equation between sin and death. What you're telling me is you don't understand how much God despises sin. What you're telling me is that you don't understand what the problem with sin is and what it's done and how destructive it is and how it kills. Mm -hmm. That's what you're telling me. You, and then you're also telling me what your desires are. Why would you want to lead a sinful life mm -hmm. when you know that the God that you serve is not pleased with it? Right. When you know that the Savior who you love died for it, so you can just go on out there and live any kind of way and do any kind of thing? That's wrong-headed, 
and it's wrong hearted. Mm -hmm. Amen. Question number two. <laughs> you don't understand what death is, do you? <laughs> you, you, you really don't understand. I think maybe you have maybe you have a fundamental understanding, a basic knowledge of what death is, that that, that as, as God had Isaiah tell Hezekiah, uh, you are going to die and not live. I just love the way that's written. You're going <laughs> to die and not live. You understand that life will lead your body. You don't know what happens after that. You don't know what the implications are of that. You don't know that at all, do you? Second question. Second answer. Let me explain it to you. What you need to understand is that when you are alive, you've got power. You can move. You can think. You can do. And you can act. You have the ability to make decisions and move about. But when you die, all the power is gone. All the decisions have already been made. There is nothing that you can do when you are dead. Now, if sin equals death, how is it that you think that you might want to live longer therein when, as a dead person, you can accomplish nothing? You don't understand what death is all about. Family, look at it this way. If you are driving in your automobile, and unfortunately, tragically, you get into an accident that totals that vehicle, and I mean totals it. The wheels have come off, the engine is smashed up, it has no way to move. Uh, fortunately, you're okay. You have not been killed, and you have not been injured. Somehow or the other, you get out of that wreckage, and you're able to stand. Uh, what? You wanting to continue to live in sin so that grace may abound would be like is you getting in that car again and trying to let it take you someplace. Let me tell you something. That car is not going to take you anywhere. Amen. And you're going to look like an idiot trying to get it started. The airbag is all out and you're standing there with the keys saying, let's go, I've got an appointment. You're not going anywhere in that. <laughs> and so if you're a little wife family, that says, I want to continue in sin, you don't understand what that is all about. That's right. Question number three. You didn't really understand what baptism was, did you? Remember, family, that Paul is talking to the church. He's talking to baptized Christians. And they're having this conversation about higher things, spirituality, the law, righteousness, faith, justification. And now we're here having this conversation about living in sin. Fine. I'm going to take you back to baptism. Do you remember when you were baptized? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember what that was like? Yes. Yeah. Do you remember what took place? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it symbolized, what it accomplished, and what it was for? Not them. Evidently, based on the questions that are being asked. You clearly didn't understand what baptism was all about. Baptism, family, is dead. Baptism is dead. It symbolizes. It represents death. It is spiritual death. Mm -hmm. But what kind of death? Well, Lee, how many kinds of death are there? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's more than one. <laughs> because what happens here in baptism is that you are dying to self. Amen. Mm -hmm. Are you with me down there? Yes. Mm -hmm. When you make the decision to become baptized, because you've heard the word of God, you believe the things that you've been told, 
You understand that we have sin in our lives, and you said sin is not what pleases God, and I need to stop sinning. That's repentance. And you confess that I need Jesus. I don't need the law. And then you agree to be baptized. You are dying to your old self. And baptism is a burial. See, we need to understand something else about baptism. It comes from the Greek word, baptizo. And it means immerse. We all know. It means to be covered by the water. Why? Because it is a burial. When someone dies, we dig a hole six feet deep and we bury them in it and we put the dirt on top of them. Let me tell you what we don't do. We don't lay our dead out in a field, get a handful of dirt, and... <laughs> Let me not go there. I'm not here to mess with anybody else. I'm just here to say what Bob said. That teams of immersion, covering. <clears throat> covering. That's what we do. We bury things that are dead. We die to ourselves. Why do we need to die to ourselves? Because it is ourselves that make decisions. And, 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 and what does that have to do with anything? Because the decisions that we make sometimes are sinful. We decide to do things that we know that we should not do. That is sin. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin, according to what the Bible says. So we need to die to ourselves because we have made decisions that have put us into sin, and sin has made us spiritually dead. So we need to die to all of that. That's what baptism does. That's what baptism accomplishes. Baptism buries us as we die ourselves. Buries us as we die to sin. It buries the bondage that we were in because of sin. You see, we were slaves to sin. We couldn't get out of it. Try as we might, there was no escape. We all worked for Satan. We all did business with Satan. We all were subject to his influences on our lives. You're dying to that. And you should want to die for that. Or die to that. Uh, so this is what baptism, but those of you who are asking, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound, you forgot or didn't ever know what baptism was, is you dying to that whole thought. How do you ask that question when by being baptized, you were dying to those things? You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to Christ who died for you. So you met them. I'm not even there yet. I'm going to get there though. Uh, we need to understand those things. So those are the questions. Now, let's move to the imitation. Let's move to the imitation. We need to understand that we have the sin nature from the first half. We understand that that's where that comes from. We also know that other, way, other places in Romans, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin death. is death. The wages of sin, remember I told you that we were in bondage and we worked with Satan? Mm -hmm. And here's what you get for, for working with Satan. Death. Mm -hmm. You die. That's what that is. And there is a physical consequence. We've already talked about that. So the thing is that we need to understand is that there is no way for us to achieve life from death, at least not in and of ourselves. If you are dead, there is nothing that you can do to bring yourself back to life. Now, I'm talking about spiritual here, mm -hmm. right? Because there's only one person who brought themselves back from physical death, and that is Jesus. So we're in the spiritual realm now, and we agree that we are spiritually dead. And so as a spiritually dead, and we've otherwise described it as being in debt, owing a debt that we could not pay, mm -hmm. we, we understand what that is. We were absolutely without means to remove ourselves from debt, to remove ourselves from guilt, to remove ourselves from an unrighteous standing in the eyes of the Lord. We don't have that power. We didn't have that ability, no way to achieve the life that we lost in and of ourselves. That is the condition of humanity. Amen. That's the situation that every person 
finds themselves in. Oh, but God. <laughs> but God made a way through Christ. God made a way through Christ. Christ came to earth in the flesh for the specific purpose of reconciling man to God. Yeah. Of paying the debt that we owed but could not pay. Christ did not owe this debt himself. But he says, I have the means. I have the ability. I have the inclination. I am willing to pay the debt for them. Oh, praise God, hallelujah, for that. Amen. Because we all want someone else to pay our debts, don't we? <laughs> I mean, we're responsible people. We pay our bills when we're supposed to, and we pay our mortgages when we're supposed to. But if someone came along, full and free, free and clear, and says, you know what, I'm going to take that for you. No conditions, no strings attached, no nothing. Okay. <laughs> Who wouldn't? And so for the debt that we were owed, oh God, Christ says, I will. Christ died for our sins. Christ died to pay our debt. Christ died to free us from that bondage. Christ died to make us spiritually alive. Christ died to provide us with eternal life. Family, uh, we, we, we need to know that there was no other way to get it. There's no other way to become just. There was no other way for us to become righteous in the sight of God. No other way. Yeah. But Christ made a way. Mm -hmm. sure. So then where does that take us? How does that all work? First Peter, chapter 3. Meet me there if you would. I don't often ask you to meet me someplace, but meet me at First Peter, chapter 3, because we're going to talk through this. Verse 18. Say amen to me today. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 18. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Peter is right. For Christ, also that for sins once for all. Now, from that whole once for all, here's what I'd like you to consider that. He died once because once was sufficient. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's not going to die again. He's not going to come back and die again. He's already died and that death was sufficient. But the other way that I want you to look at this is that he died for all. For every one of us. And when I say us, I don't just mean those of us who happen to be uh, the blessed members of the Fairgrounds Road Church of Christ. Uh, I'm not talking about for those who happen to be the blessed members of the Church of Christ Universal, wherever your Church of Christ is. Uh, I'm not talking about just that. I mean for everybody, every human that's ever lived, his blood is sufficient. Those who live righteous lives in the Old Testament before he ever came along, that blood reaches back. Yep. Those who were standing at the foot of the cross, that blood was sufficient. And for those of us who came along a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand, three thousand, if necessary, years later, that blood is still sufficient. It's like that grace, it's just how. It's like that cleaning agent, it can just get out every sin. Uh, well, not that sin. No, yes, your sin. What makes you think that your sin is so great that it can overcome the blood of Jesus? Stop it. That blood, that blood was sufficient. Christ died once for all. The just, the Bible says, which refers to him, he is just. For the unjust, guess who that is? That's us. That's all of us. The just Christ died for the unjust us. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to get from that. So that, watch this, he may bring us to God. Christ came in order to reconcile us with the God who made us. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was the purpose. It's important that we understand that. His purpose in coming was to bring us to God. He said that in what? John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Amen. That's why he's here. 
The Bible says, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Christ died on that cross. He died a real and physical death. Oh, but he took his life back up again. Because we know that in the spirit, uh, he never died. He died in the body. But he never ceased to exist. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me so. Look at what the Bible says here. Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which the spirit that, 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 that he was made alive in, in that spirit, he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. It gets complicated in here, but just stay, just, just stay bubbled up, right? Who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now, I realize that, that can be confusing. This is not my lesson. We can spend more time with it later. But the interpretation of that is that it was the spirit of Christ mm -hmm. who was alive in Noah and preached to the disobedient at that time. He references it right here. He made proclamation to the spirits that are now in prison who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Okay? Don't get confused about where the spirit of Jesus went while he was on the cross. He's talking about the fact that those who were disobedient and alive in the time of Noah are now in prison. But he, in the spirit through Noah, tried to preach to them salvation. But they weren't hearing it. They weren't having it, which is why they're in prison now. And let me tell you something, church. You can't die unrighteous and somehow in death become righteous. Amen. I need you to get that. I need you to get that. Because there are people who think that. There are people who think that there's a place called purgatory uh, where if you work off certain penance, if you do certain things, your unrighteousness can be absolved and then you can move on into heaven. There's no Bible for that anywhere. Amen. None. Yep. I don't know where that even came from. And so don't get confused about what it's saying here. The spirit of Christ was operating in Noah when he preached to those who were disobedient at that time, trying to give them an opportunity. Now watch this. He's talking about the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Noah and his family were brought through the water on the ark because he was obedient. He was not disobedient like those spirits that he was preaching to that are now in prison, but he was obedient, and he was brought through the destruction of the world, right. which happened to involve water. Hang on. Verse 21, corresponding to that, corresponding to that, corresponding to that, which is linking those two thoughts, baptism now saves you. Amen. Did I say that or is that in your Bible? It's in the Bible. Corresponding to the way that Noah and his family were brought through the water, mm -hmm. baptism also saved. Did I say that or is that in the Bible? It's in the Bible. Okay. And there's a distinction here. He says, not the removal of the dirt from the flesh. What do you suppose that means? It means that when you go down into the watery grave of baptism, you're not there for a bath. <laughs> you're not washing dirt away from flesh. That's not what this is about. As Noah and his family were brought through the water into salvation, you and I are going through the water into that same salvation. Amen. And what it also means, family, when it talks about the thing, not the washing away of filth from the flesh, it means that it's just water. It means physically that when you get baptized, you are going to get wet. The wetness is incidental. The water is incidental. There's no healing or saving properties in the H2O. There isn't. No one says that there is. There's more to it as it relates to the spiritual aspect, but the physical aspect isn't washing dirt from your flesh. You are just going to get wet by the water and the water's not magical. You want to know how I know the water's not magical? Because I see Doug coming here every Sunday and he's back there putting his hands in it and getting it warm and making sure that everything looks good in case we have somebody that baptized. There's no magic. It's Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for 
for a good conscience. Mm -hmm. Don't get that confused either. And appeal to God for a good conscience. What's a good conscience? We none of us want a guilty conscience. We want to be able to stand before God without guilt. Therefore, we then appeal to God. Can you help me with my guilt complex? Because my guilt complex comes from sin. And, and I know that if I can get rid of my sin, I can get rid of my guilt. And then I can stand before you uh, without a guilty conscience. But with a good conscience. Is that all right? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and you can do that not because of who you are. You can do that not because of what you've done. You can do that because Christ died for you, took away your sins, and therefore you now have nothing to be guilty about. You've received this righteousness, and you can stand in front of God without a guilty conscience, but instead with a good one. That's what baptism does. Through the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. Had he just died? Had he just been buried. No good. Yep. The resurrection was the key. Mm -hmm. Because he was able to take up his own life back and be seen to people and minister to people. That's what makes it effective, family. And, and then listen, I would add this. In John chapter 3, verse 5, John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus had a conversation with a guy named Nicodemus. He's part of the ruling council. And he's kind of stood with those guys. But under cover of darkness, he comes to Jesus, and he's got some questions. Jesus ends up telling him this. He says, listen, truly, truly, I say unto you, Nicodemus, the last one is born of water and spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Don't let anybody tell you that the water is amniotic fluid. <laughs> Because there's no place in the Bible that refers to water as such. There's plenty of references to water. Uh, and they're usually in reference to either the spirit or everlasting life. <laughs> and so it is the water in baptism along with the spirit of God that causes us to be reborn. Amen. Reborn alive. <clears throat> and members of the family of God. That same order that destroyed the unbelievers in Noah's time delivered the ark that was built through faith. Because most of that is to say, Noah heard God, believed God, and went to work building the ark. And when the rain came, that ark was carried by the water. Mm -hmm. And through that carrying by the water, they were saved. Through the law, he was transferred from death and punishment to life and freedom through the water. And it is referred to as baptism. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Moses and the Hebrews in the Red Sea. They were covered by the cloud, <clears throat> which is water. And they went through the Red Sea, which is water. And they were said to experience the baptism into Moses. And so we're seeing that water is a functional aspect of moving from death, destruction, and bondage to life. Amen. In Moses' case with the people, they went from slavery, bondage, and death well, at the hands of, of the soldiers mm -hmm. to life. Noah, from death of the world to life. You and I from death, bondage, and destruction through the water to life. Amen. Amen. That's what this thing is about, family. That is what this thing is about. In baptism, we imitate Christ's death. See, now we're to the, to the intent. We're imitating Christ's death. We're connecting to the death that he died for us in this baptism. Mm -hmm. uh, we are meeting him. And, you know, when you take a look at the grammar, and I try not to be too much of an egghead with you folks, uh, but when you get into tenses like things like the aorist and all that stuff, essentially what it means in the way that it is written is when we die with Christ, it is as if we are on the cross with him mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago. That's, 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 that's what the, the scripture <coughs> conveys in its original language. 
Uh, it also conveyed that we were in the body of Adam and Eve when they committed sin, which is why we all have sin nature. First Adam. Second Adam comes along, gets up on the cross, and when we go down into this watery grave of baptism, we are transported back 2,000 years and dying on the cross with him. That's how this thing works. This is why Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. That's why it says what it says. Let me wrap this up, the intent. Let's get to that little job here. An amazing thing happened after Christ died. He rose. <laughs> Praise oh. God, hallelujah. He rose. Yes. And as we died with him in baptism, family, they don't leave us down there in the water. We drown. Right? They tip us down and they pull us up. We rise just as Christ rose. As he rose from death, we rise from the burial in baptism. Uh, we are imitating him. And it is our intent that we likewise rise with him at the end of time. We rise out of this life into the next life. We are resurrected as Christ himself was. And when we do so, when we come up out of the baptism, we experience the newness of life. The Bible says that we are new creatures. We're not the same people that went down into the water. Understand that physically you get wet. Let's not get that confused because the, the, the functional aspect of baptism happens in the spiritual realm. Physically, all you do is get wet. And, and I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to make an assumption here that when you experience your baptism, uh, or when you see a baptism, you probably never heard trumpets. You, you probably never heard the celebration that's going on in heaven, even though we went, there is one there. And so in the physical realm, you're just getting wet. But in the spiritual realm, you are going from death to life. You're being made a new creature. Mm -hmm. You've been bought with the blood of Christ. And we are then to make ourselves living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable worship. We become new. We receive forgiveness of sin. We are made righteous. We are made just. We are reconciled uh, to God. We are adopted into God's family. We become co-inheritors with Jesus. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit who takes up residence in us. We are clothed with Christ and filled with Christ. You know, for those who say that baptism isn't necessary, uh, I would wonder how else we receive forgiveness of sin without it. Uh, I would wonder how we would clothe ourselves in Christ without it. That's what Galatians 3 27 says. Clothe yourselves in Christ. Paul also said that uh, it's, it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And so we've got Christ on the outside. We've got Christ on the inside. We're surrounded and filled with it can't be any better mm -hmm. than that. Right. And that family is what baptism does. And it's all made available to us by the grace of God mm -hmm. through faith. <laughs> Free! No trouble. The ways of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal that's the role that baptism plays in this salvation story. So as we tell the gospel and we tell the story, baptism is a part of it that we should not leave out. Because we've just read it, what it accomplishes. If you didn't know, now you know. If you have questions, by all means, let's continue to talk about it. But this is what the Bible says. Amen. Is that all right? Amen. Amen. Family, we have needs today. Is there any morning you'd like to need people to stand with you in prayer and need people to pray for you? Uh, you can make that known right now. And if you have not yet named the name of Christ, if you have not yet accepted his free offer, having died on the cross for you, having been buried and rose on the third day, in order that your sins may be forgiven you, that you may be adopted into the family, that you may be a child of God and have an inheritance that is unimaginably, unimaginably vast. That can be done right now as well. For those of you who are watching with us, that offer is available to you as well. Just contact us. Contact us right via this page, and we will respond. We will have conversations. We will pray. We'll do a Bible study. We'll do whatever we need to do to make you a member of the family of God. Not that we have that power in and of ourselves, but that it's been made available. We're
we're just agents. That's all we are. <laughs> we're just agents. We work for the king, but it is happy work, and we love it, and we want to give you a job, too. Uh, so, family, let's keep these things in mind. Let's be energized. Let's be encouraged. Let's be edified by these things. Now we have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Let's tell it. Is that all right? All right. Let's see Amen. Oh, the good and the voice of Jesus.